Good morning to you. My name is Valencia Robinson, and I am very glad that your pastor, Basil Bell, has invited me to be here with you. And I would like to say hi to the church and bless this church in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God is good. And all the time... Amen. Glory to God. I, as a men's ministry leader, I have an announcement to make. Para aquellos que hablan español, el día 20 de noviembre vamos a tener un congreso de varones. Queremos que usted esté con nosotros virtualmente por medio de YouTube o por medio de Facebook. Si se meten a ya sea YouTube o Facebook, pueden poner Ministerio de Varones SSC y van a hallar nuestra página. Y va a estar en vivo comenzando a las 11 de la mañana. Vamos a tener un buen predicador. Vamos a tener un mini concierto en la tarde. Vamos a tener otra predicación. Es un predicador internacional, un evangelista que va a estar con nosotros. Y tendremos el doctor Samuel Bolívar que también estará con nosotros. That's a short announcement for the Hispanic people. Uh, I'm the director of men's ministry. And that's the last event we're having for this year. Today's message... Abounding in all grace. I like the special music. It's about grace. So I'd like to read the words of that song. It says, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretched like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace. That's the way our God is. <clears throat> so we're going to base uh, the message today on 2 Corinthians 9, 8. It says, if you want to read with me, you're welcome. And God is able to make all grace abound in you, that you, always having all you need in all things, you may abound in every good work. Blessed be the word of God. I would like you to participate also in this song, which you know already, it's in the hymnal. I will read the non-bolded, and I ask you to read the bolded part. This is a proclamation. Would you be free from the burden of sin? Would you over evil a victory win? There is power, power, wonder working power. Wonder working power together, everybody. Wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Glory be to God. There is power. Now, question, what does this verse have to do with this song? Let me tell you, they are both proclamations. And the power of God is in several instruments he has given us. Prayer, fasting, vigils, prayer vigils. Also in proclamations. So this is one of those instruments that God has given us so we could be free from all evil, including sin itself. I like the old hymns because there's a lot of truth in the old hymns. This is one of them. One of the things that I believe you wish, and so do I, is that this church can grow, right? That one day when I come back, there'll be more people in the pews. Well, proclamation is one of those things that we can do to fix that problem. So are declarations or proclamations biblical? Here are some of them on the screen. Jesus declared, 
Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Do we still have the Bible? Yes. Amen. And that is because Jesus made a proclamation. His word is with us. Best-selling book still today. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. Was that a proclamation? Yes. Is God able to raise people from the dead? Yes. Will God raise people from the dead at the second coming? Yes. Now here's a harder question. Will God raise people before the second coming? Yes. I mean, Jesus said, greater works you will do. And the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit is yet to come. I believe it's soon to come. So Jesus also said, when he had thus spoken, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. That was a proclamation. And that was made after a short prayer, by the way. And all of a sudden, the dead came to life. Also, it says in Psalms 33, 9, For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. In Spanish, existió, which means it existed. Was that a proclamation? Yes. I mean, from nothing, here comes everything. Isn't that amazing? The power of proclamation. Jesus declared a curse on a fig tree. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter or ever. And his disciples heard it. Following day, they came by the same way. And there was a tree dried from the roots. Teacher, it dried up. The tree that you cursed. And what did Jesus tell them? Jesus said, yes, if you have faith, you can also do this. And not only that, but uproot trees and send them to the sea and make mountains move. Wow. You know what? There is a passage of uh, the spirit of prophecy that says that with the power of God, we also will be like everything. Everything is possible. In other words, everything is possible for God through us by his power, by proclamations. Jesus proclaimed a curse on that tree. I'm not getting into reasons of that. The fact is that God wants us to make proclamations. And here is an example of it. You heard the news. Afghanistan fell to the bad guys, basically. There were people stuck in there. And I heard stories of how they were escaping. Here's just one group. There's many more miracles, but this is just one group. They were um, approaching the border. And somebody told them, you better not get there because you guys are Christians. They're going to kill you. The guys in charge of that border, they're terrorists. They approached because they had been praying. They had faith in God. And the people at the border, they rejected them. No way. You won't get past this border. So they came back. They prayed and prayed and prayed. I mean, they really prayed. And then one of them says, we got to go back. So the leader said, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that border will be open to us. That was a proclamation. When he finished proclaiming, they went back to the border and the guys, they had their mouth open. It's like they couldn't believe what was happening. They were being defied. They just let them by. They let them by. 
No explanation. I don't know what happened. I don't know how. All I know is it happened because God is good. Because there is power in proclamations if we have faith. And at the end, I'll tell you another, another one of those stories. Sowing and reaping. This is the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It's talking about giving. The Corinthian church had promised to send donations for the saints. And then in the context, it qualifies the saints as those who sow. In other words, those who preach the gospel. And and, uh, Paul is thanking them for that. And he says, there's no reason for me to remind you. And then he, he says, your generosity is known by many all over. And because of your promise, many have also proposed to give like you. And then he keeps on talking and he comes up to this one verse that says, every man according as he proposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly. He's talking about the offering that was going to be picked up for the missionaries. And he said that every man as he proposed, let him give, not grudgingly, or forcing himself, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. That's our verse today. That you, always having all you need in all things, you may abound in every good work, and so on and so forth. Now, if you notice in that verse... There are two things. Number one, abundance to give. And number two, grace for every good work. Did you notice that? It's like Paul is mixing two things into one. The experts will tell you that they are not sure. I mean, there's they're not, not agreement among them. That... It could mean that he's talking about the good work of giving, but I believe in the context, it's also speaking about the good works of righteousness. Do you see the bold? He has dispersed abroad and has given to the poor. That's the financial And then it says, his righteousness remains forever. And then at the end, it says, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So it's obvious in the whole context that there's two main themes in that verse. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. Number one, God will supply by his grace all your need, your financial need, or any other kind of need, including the need for righteousness. So what is the definition of righteousness? Here are some passages that I'd like to share with you. This one is found in Review and Herald, August 21, 18, in the 1800s, 1894. Righteousness means being good. What is righteousness? Being good and doing good. As children of God, we are developing a character. I mean, it's asking a question. Are we developing a character that is Christ-like? It's assuming that we should. Jesus loved righteousness and hated iniquity. What is righteousness? It is the satisfaction that Christ gave the divine law in our behalf. So when Jesus died on the cross, he was giving his perfection on our behalf so that we may have imputed righteousness. But he was also, and this is another sermon for another day, giving his blood so that we may have His righteousness imparted like an inheritance. In other words, it is not just a righteousness to cover our iniquity. It is a righteousness 
to get rid of our iniquity. But it's still his righteousness. It's not our righteousness. It comes from God. Everything is from God. So that's the definition of righteousness. Jesus dying on the cross and becoming righteousness for us, both for the past and for the future as well. Um, the other theme that we're talking about is giving in 2 Corinthians 9, 8. Ellen G. White says, giving for the necessity of the saints and for the advancement of the kingdom of God is preaching practical sermons, which testify that those who give have not received the grace of God in vain. So, it's stressing the need to give. By the way, there are those who give and are blessed. And those who don't give, exactly. According to Malachi 3, they get a curse, actually. This is not my word. This is the word of God. I'm just telling you, it's, it's there. But let me tell you, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. What I'm trying to do is say that the passage is talking about giving. And Paul, if you read the whole context, he is approaching it in a positive way. One day, I was leading out a campaign to raise money in a church. And the, the amount of money had raised to about $80,000. However it seemed like we were kind of stuck. And I promised in front of the congregation, I'm going to give $1,000. And a few weeks went by, and the money was increasing by just a little bit, maybe uh, 500 a 1000 more, whatever. And then all of a sudden, I kept my promise. And in a few weeks, the money went to 120 and I said, how did that happen? People were waiting for me to give. <laughs> you know, Paul was talking about that in that context. He's saying other people have been stimulated by your pledge. So it's really something very good to give. Abounding in grace. So there are four points. This is the f first point. And God is able. In other words, God is almighty. God is all-powerful. God can do all things. There's nothing impossible for God. If he just speaks and creates worlds, he creates sun systems, he creates galaxies, he can do anything. This is amazing. And that's just in, in the past. Now, how about in the future? The Bible tells us, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I mean, somebody had to create it, right? It's our creator. So he's a creator in the past, in the future. How about in the present? You know, it says in Ezekiel 36, 26, it says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. That's a promise. And it also says... It says, this is another one, Psalms 51.10, create in me a pure heart, a clean heart, and renew a right spirit within me. Isn't it talking about creating? Yes. I don't know about you, but me, God is not finished yet. He is creating in me a new heart and renewing a right spirit within me. And God is the beginning and he is the ending. He is the first and he is the last. He is the alpha and he is the omega. He starts and he finishes. Blessed be the name of God. God is able. That's the first point. He's able to create in us a new heart. He's able to give us that righteousness. It comes from him. And then he says to make all grace abound in you. What does the word grace mean? Grace 
means primarily two things. There's more than that. Number one, grace is unmerited favor for the sinner. You come to God boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and grace. Hebrews 4.16. So, grace is unmerited favor, but it is also the capacity. In other words, God enables you to do it. So I'll give you an example. My wife and I are foster parents, and we thank God that the 10-year-old asked for baptism. Um, the small ones, they're kind of like hard to, to control, so they didn't go to church today. So, but there's all, all already a date in November for the baptism, a date when I'm not preaching. So I thank God because of that. However, one day, the four-year-old was not sleeping at night. Well, maybe he slept an hour or, or an hour and a half. So that means that we were not sleeping, especially my wife. So one morning... My wife says, dear God, give me the grace. And she tells me that she all of a sudden felt energy. She all of a sudden felt like she slept all night long. And she was good the whole day. That is grace. The capacity. God opens the way where there's no way opened. There's this one guy. This happened a long time ago. He was traveling by horseback. And he didn't know that his enemy was waiting for him at night to kill him on that dark road where there's no witnesses. And all of a sudden, he hears a voice turn to the left. And the guy says, there's nothing to the left. He keeps on going. He hears a voice turn to the left. He says, but there's nothing there. There's no way. It's just thick jungle. No way a horse can go through there. And then he hears the voice again turn to the left. Finally, he says, this must be God. He turned to the left. He expected to find dense jungle, but lo and behold, there is a way in the thick jungle. He could see thick jungle on the left, thick jungle on the right, and he was on a path. He said, I had no idea that this path existed. He gets home. He goes to sleep and wakes up in the morning and somebody tells him, did you know that so-and-so was waiting to kill you last night? I thought you were going to be dead. And he said, well, I'm alive. And where, how did you make it? I went a different way. What way? Well, I went through the jungle. That's impossible. And he says, I'll show you. So they went back. And when he showed his friend, he couldn't find the way. He, he looked and looked and looked and looked. There's no way at all. You know, that's what I call... Grace. God opened the way where there was no way. And God opens way not only for that guy, but for you and I too. When there's no way open, I can tell you stories I won't, but uh, you guys want to go home early. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you one of them. Um, when I was a teenager, I was skateboarding. This is the first car I had. Back then, I only paid $300 for that car. It was an old car. Well, it broke down on me on my way to San Diego. It got hot. The radio got hot. The meter went all the way to the right. 
And I didn't know what to do. I wasn't a mechanic. I was just a teenager. So I learned quickly that if I let it rest for half an hour, I can drive it. Adding water, I can drive it further. But that thing just was a nuisance. But I, I called the director of, uh, and he told me the address of the other guys in that area who were culporting. So I went and spent the night over there. However, in the morning I had it fixed. I took, it, uh, I, uh, I took out the radiator, that much I could do. And then I went to the, uh, I took out the radiator and then put it back in when they were done. And it started getting hot again. And I didn't want to call anybody. So I called upon God. And I just started praying and praying. I said, God, this radiator has been rebuilt and it doesn't work. What am I to do? And it's like, it's almost like a voice, but it's not. It's like an impression. So I went to a, the nearest gas station. And I explained it because in, back in those days, most gas stations were mechanic shops. And I, asked, I said to the guy, what's happening? And he says, well, it may be your thermostat. And I had no idea that cars had thermostats in them. So he had to point out to me where the thermostat is. And I said, can you lend me a tool? And he did. And so I took out the thermostat. And I think it cost about a dollar and 50 cents. Nowadays, it's a lot more than that. <clears throat> Some of you are mechanics, huh? So when I got done, put the gasket, tightened the screws, returned the tool. I, by the way, back then those cars were easy to fix. Nowadays you have to take a bunch of stuff off just to get to it. Um, it worked. And I said, wow, God came through to me. It was through prayer that, that it did work. Thank God. And that car functioned for at least another, what, four or five years. It was good. I drove it all over the place. Okay, so the next one, part three. Always having all you need in all things. I got a question for you. When Israel was in the desert and they got thirsty, did God abandon them? No. When they got hungry, did God abandon them? No. When they were in danger of serpents, did God abandon them? No. Except when they grumbled and complained. They were being ungrateful to the God who had protected them all along. But God always provides in all our needs all things necessary. That is the God we have. He is not only a God of Israel in the desert. He's our God today, here, now. Providing for us in our needs. God is good, isn't he? Amen. And all the time, he is good. And so what is the last part, the last point? To be able to abound in every good work. My friends... God is not only powerful to provide our food, our water, our rent, our mortgage, our car payment, our insurance payment, whatever other bill you have. God is powerful in providing our spiritual needs. And one of our spiritual needs is that we can conquer sin. God made us to be conquerors. You know what? This is not us. This is God. I'm not saying we win heaven. I'm not talking about salvation, how we are saved. No, I'm assuming you're all saved. But I am saying that God provides the way that we don't have to fall into sin. And that is by the grace that we can abound in every good work. And part of that is giving, but part of that is all of the rest. 
Now, I think everybody here has either experienced fear or anger or temptation or anxiety. And sometimes you're so angry, you just want to hurt somebody or even kill somebody. I mean, it's happened to me. I'm sure I'm not the only one here. How do we solve that problem? This is the way I do it. Try it. It really works. El que habita al abrigo del Altísimo. Well, let's look it up because you guys know it. It's just, I don't know it in English. Psalm 91. Do you guys remember what that says? He who dwells Okay, so if you keep on saying that, and even if you didn't memorize it, you put it in your pocket, and you take it out when you're tempted, when you're afraid, when you want to kill somebody, whenever you're anxious, you take it out. You start repeating, because sometimes you can't control those thoughts in your heads. And you don't want to kill somebody, right? I mean, I hope not. So you start repeating Psalm 91. What are you doing? You are proclaiming the word. And as you proclaim the word, all of a sudden you enter from the physical realm to the spiritual realm. You're no longer in the flesh. You are now in the spirit. I want you to to turn with me to Romans chapter 7 and 8. And Paul is talking about this. He ends chapter 7 in a quite negative way. This is the Valencio translation, since I don't have the English Bible with me. It says in verse 23, But I see another law in my members that rebels against the law of the Spirit. And that takes me captive to the law of sin that is in my members. What a miserable man am I? Who will liberate me from the body of this death? I thank God by Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he comes to chapter 8. And if you keep on reading, it's talking about being in the Spirit. Now, There is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. For those those who are walking according, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Because the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ has liberated me from the law of sin and death. So when you start proclaiming the word of God, all of a sudden you're no longer in the flesh You're in the spirit, and all of a sudden you can control those thoughts that wanted to do evil or doubt God when you're afraid you're doubting God. And you're able to conquer. Is that easy? Not for me. Am I perfect? No. Are you perfect? Okay, so we're in the same boat, aren't we? So it says... In verse 18, because I am certain that during this time what we suffer, it is of no comparison to the glory that will come. In other words, in our process to be in the spirit and to get out of the flesh, there is suffering Paul is acknowledging it here. And if you keep on reading, it also talks about suffering here on earth. And Jesus said that he who wants to come and follow me must deny himself, take up the cross, and follow me. So there is that, you know, that moment when you don't, you don't like it. But it, it's the hunger of the flesh 
for the sin that it's used to. And there will come a time when that dies because the following happens. There's this one guy who said, I was training my dog not to eat and I thought I had been successful, but he died on me. (laughs) I know that's a bad story, but there comes a time when you're dead to the flesh. If you keep on doing what it says in Romans 8. But let us finish. Let us finish. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So in other words, don't worry as much for your material goods or needs as for your spiritual goods. Worry about two things. There's only two things you can take to heaven. Number one, your character. Number two, the souls that God has given you. Thank God that this child is not the first to be baptized in our foster home. We praise God. All of us should be working towards these two goals. See, seek ye first the kingdom of God. In other words, saving souls. And his righteousness. In other words, doing good. Seek ye first these two things. These are the things that you can take to heaven. All the rest you can't. You can buy gold, but you can't take it to heaven. You can have really good things that money can buy, but they will burn. These are the things that God wants you to seek first. His kingdom and his righteousness. So we need to finish, don't we? We'll finish. Um, But my God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory. I like that promise. And in conclusion, I want to tell you first a story about a proclamation. This happened just a few weeks ago. The the video cassette player jammed on me. I couldn't pull out the video cassette. The VHS player just... I thought I was going to throw it away, but then it occurred to me, no, this is not the first time. I'm going to proclaim. So I did. I stood in front of that player, the old device... And I said, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, be broken the curse of this player. My thought was, Satan is trying to keep me and my wife from sharing the Bible stories with the children that I have in video cassettes. And lo and behold, when I pressed the eject button, it not only came out, I was able to pull it out, and before I was not able to pull it out at all. You know what? Today, when I finished this Hispanic sermon, one of the ladies, she told me, just yesterday, my washing machine quit on me. It wouldn't work. So I claimed to God, just like you did, And it started working. This is yesterday, Friday. I'd like to hear your story. Maybe you have another story for me when when we go out today. God is powerful. And let us finish with the last two sections, the last three sections, because these are proclamations. I'd like you to read with me, please. God is able. He is the omnipotent, the almighty, the creator, He is the great I am. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the omniscient, the omnipresent God. He is able. God is the owner of all the gold and silver, the cattle on a thousand hills on all the earth. He is able to supply our needs. God has all the grace We need that we can abound in good works of righteousness. We have hope in our battle against sin. God's grace. 
Amen. May God bless us.